Hello and welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the podcast, this is where we explore the practical science of lasting well-being. And if you've listened before, welcome back. It's natural to have moments, even in the course of a generally happy, generally pretty fulfilling life, where we question our meaning, value, and purpose. This is often concentrated when we face the reality of our own mortality. And there's nothing quite like a pandemic to cast that one into sharp relief. So today we're exploring a topic that's been top of mind, I think, for many people over the last year and a half, existential dread. How can we face our ends and find the meaning and purpose that can help us live good lives? To help us do that, I'm joined as usual by Dr. Rick Hansen. Rick is a clinical psychologist, a best-selling author, and he's also my dad. So dad, based on our uh, warm-up conversation that we had to kind of set this recording up, I'm guessing that you're not feeling a lot of existential dread right now, but feel free to correct me here. <laughs> well, I, you know, words mean different things for different people, and sometimes <laughs> there are these technical <laughs> meanings. And one of the um, words that's also bandied around with regard to existentialism is nausea. <laughs> and so when I look into myself in the plain meaning of nausea or dread, no, I, I am not experiencing either one of them. I am experiencing a lot of interest in this topic, which is absolutely one of the root matters for anyone to engage in this life. What's the point? Why bother? What am I doing here? Right? Uh, that goes way beyond TGIF. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's totally fair. It's a great setup. Before we get into the episode, I do want to offer a couple of quick reminders for people. First, you can follow us on all of the social medias. I've linked our profiles in the description of today's episode. And then finally, if you'd like to support the podcast, we have a Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. And for the cost of just a couple cups of coffee a month, you can support the show and you'll receive a bunch of bonuses in return, like transcripts, expanded show notes, and ad-free versions of the episodes. So kind of getting into our topic here today, I think that it might be helpful to provide a little bit of framing of what we're actually talking about here. As you said, Dad, words can mean kind of different things to different people, and the phrase existential dread may or may not be resonant for you if you're listening to this right now. But to really simplify this and to kind of boil it all down, we're talking about meaning and purpose. How can we find meaning and purpose in a life when uh, there are all of these people who've spent a lot of time kind of categorizing the various ways in which there isn't a lot of external structure to life that inherently gives us meaning and purpose. So it comes to us kind of to find what that purpose is. Does that more or less sound right to you, Dad? If I'm following you, you're setting up the basis for existentialism yeah, as totally. a philosophy mm -hmm. and even as, as a way to approach um, the problems and the, the suffering that could bring people to psychotherapy or, or more broadly preoccupy people. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like, here we are, consciousness was inflicted upon unsuspecting flesh. Mom and I did that to you many, many years ago. And then you popped into the world, right? I remember the day you were born, your eyes were wide open, you were looking around <laughs> and to the extent that I can imagine what in the world you were experiencing non-verbally, it was kind of on the order of, wow, what the heck? <laughs> you know, that combination of the two things. What am I going to do now? I'm here. I have a human body. I'm subject to pain and sorrow and loss, old age, disease and death. What's this all about? So yeah, I think these are fundamental questions. You've done a deep dive for us into existentialism. At this point, you know more about it than I do as a philosophy. And maybe we could just sort of use that with respect as a jumping off point. Would you be willing to summarize some of the key points you've come across? Sure. Understanding that I am not a philosopher. And again, I alluded to kind of a setup conversation that we had. It was about an hour before we're recording right now to kind of take you behind the curtain a little bit. And we uh, both kind of agreed that neither of us has a profound pull toward philosophy in general, but I'm going to kind of do my best here to take, I think, what's a very root experience for people, um, just down in the core, you know, where we have this question of why does it matter or how can I find meaning in my life? 
And then people have gone through these fairly elaborate processes of trying to build frameworks around that. Um, there are people like Dr. Irving Yalom, who uh, is a master of existential psychotherapy, and he identified these four basic issues that people have. And the first one is that death is inevitable. Um, first basic issue, death. We're all going to die one day, and we need to grapple with that in our lives. The second one is this idea of freedom, which is because the world is not inherently structured, and our behavior is not inherently controlled by some external entity, we have to give the world a structure ourselves. We have to construct our own world. Third, there's this issue of isolation, which is just no matter how close we come to another person, there's always going to be a degree of separation from them. So we can debate the extent to which this is true practically, but from a philosophical perspective, we're always alone. And therefore, we have this question of meaninglessness. If we all are going to die, if we construct our own world, and if we're isolated from others, what meaning can life possibly have? And he identified that when people confront these four basic issues, it tends to lead to what we think of as a quote-unquote existential crisis. Uh, the proximity of death is a natural trigger for it, but so are moments when you feel like you've left the structure of your normal life, or when you feel particularly isolated from other people. These can all be kind of cues into the experience of an existential crisis where you start to question life's meaning. And for a lot of people, that is just an absolute highway fast track into uh, depression, depressive mood states, and many of the things that we've talked about on the podcast in the past. That's a great summary. And I find myself more sympathetic than I started <laughs> with an existentialist <laughs> view. I think it's really... Uh, you, well, for our purposes, we're going to bring this down into the pragmatics of everyday living and the psychology and the emotion. And we're going to try to not go up into the clouds, really, of intellectual abstractions, as interesting as those might be. So we're going to keep it down to earth. And reflecting on this forest, I think so much of this topic is summarized in these lines from the poet Mary Oliver that many people are familiar with. She asks, tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Right there, we have so much, don't we? We have uh, the sense of the wildness of your life, this inherent openness and unpredictability even in a fairly structured and constrained life. We have the preciousness of it. Uh, human birth is rare. And being born, think of the lottery of all the humans who've ever been born over 300,000 years of anatomically modern humans. And think of getting a lottery ticket that before you were born, you cashed in to land in the particular body and time and place in which you were born. I think many people would consider even with all its difficulties, catching a ticket to be born today rather than 150 years ago in Deccan's London or 1,500 years ago in post-Rome um, <laughs> Europe, Europe. Sure, right? yeah. Or 15,000 or 150,000 years ago, they'd pick it today. Okay, so it's precious. There's a precious opportunity here. And tell me what you plan to do because existential freedom and responsibility, that's the other word that's typically put together with freedom. There's an inherent, inescapable responsibility for the choices we make. We cannot not plan to do something with this one wild and precious life. Even if we say, no, 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 I don't want to plan to do it. Well, that's your plan. So, okay, so we've kind of framed it there. And then I would like to highlight just one more element. Speaking of the inevitability of death, it's really broader than that, I think, in that living um, as a human body, it forces us to recognize our inherent frailty. We're frail, we're, we're vulnerable. Uh, uh, we're one car crash away. We're one careless driver next to us on the freeway away. We're one phone call away from the worst day of our life. And I've had friends, I had a friend recently who on his birthday developed some chest pains that put him in the ER that led to a terminal diagnosis within hours of him landing there and to his own death less than six months later. How do we, how do we deal with that? And also how do we face the inherent 
impermanence of all experiences. All experiences are transitory. They're continually changing. Even if they're kind of sort of stable, like a standing wave, they're continually disappearing beneath our feet. There's the inherent groundlessness, as is spoken of in Zen, of our experience. How do we come to terms with that? How do we come to terms with that? It's a great framing for all of it. And just to kind of pick up where you left off, the confrontation of that frailty for people is very stressful. And for a lot of people, very overwhelming. And kind of with that more philosophical bent, people generally think that if we fully confront the enormity of that all at once without availability of some of the techniques or things that we're going to talk about maybe later in the episode, it becomes completely overwhelming. And it's very, very emotionally challenging for somebody to deal with. I remember, um, I've told this story on the podcast in the past, but I remember quite vividly the first time that I realized that I was going to die. I think that I was like six or seven years old. Um, we were heading towards some perfectly normal thing and this thought just entered my brain and I couldn't get it out of my brain and I just had a total emotional fit yeah. like in confrontation with the reality <laughs> of my impending doom as a seven-year-old, you know? <laughs> so like it was, it was a long way down the stream and yet I was like very absorbed with it in that moment. I don't know, maybe it, I had had like a fish that had died or something and I realized that I too like that fish would one day die. But whatever, um, that initial contact is extremely stressful. So what the brain does or what our consciousness does, however you kind of want to frame it, it does the same thing that it does with any painful psychological material. We repress it in a variety of different ways. We remove it from our moment to moment conscious awareness. And there are different kinds of coping strategies that people can have. There was this guy, uh, Peter Weissel Zapfa, I hope I'm saying that correctly. He was a Norwegian philosopher. He sort of theorized that people had these four basic approaches to dealing with uh, the confrontation of that frailty. And I, I really like your language, Dad, there. I think that it's really good. Um, the first one is this idea of isolation, which is basically full repression. We dismiss the anxiety-provoking material. We don't deal with it. We don't think about it. You can think of a lot of people who use that tactic. And honestly, I personally don't think that that tactic's like the end of the world or anything. The second approach that people have is referred to as anchoring a lot of the time, which is this idea that you might have a set of core values or some sense of higher purpose that allows the person to focus their attention away from that dread. And this could include religious frameworks, a belief in God, spirituality, personal morality, uh, however you want to think about it. Then there's distraction as a big approach that people have. You limit the attention that you can pay to existential dread by constantly distracting yourself. If what I just said about anchoring is maybe a little bit more eudaimonic, if you want to think about it this way, distraction is mostly hedonic. Uh, lots of hedonic forms of coping would kind of fall under distraction. And then finally, this is the fourth one. It's generally thought of as being the most like positive strategy. Uh, sublimation, which is a kind of fancy word that basically means that you refocus your energy away from the more negative outlets, the more negative thoughts, the dread, toward more positive ones. Um, and you can think of a lot of people over the course of human history who have turned their consideration of existential dread into the beautiful production of art or the creation of some powerful idea that influenced people. Um, and that would be different forms of sublimation. And that's where I'm going to toss it over to you, Dad. Um, as you've mentioned a couple of times during the conversation already, you don't really have an orientation where you are worried about these considerations. You don't find the fact that you're going to die seemingly particularly bothersome. And I'm wondering what it is that you're doing that's leading to that stance inside of yourself. I would say that three psychological challenges that are embedded in this whole conversation have actually been very, very real for me. Uh, one is the challenge of what to do with the inherent vulnerability and frailty and impermanence of experience and human existence. That's definitely been a real one for me. Second, uh, finding fundamental purposes for being in this life relating to Mary Oliver's question. In other words, as some people put it, what's your why? Or why bother? 
what's the what's the point? Why are you here? What do you want to do with with all of this? I've definitely grappled with that, even to the point of, and I can talk about it, uh, a brush with suicidality. And then there's a third kind of topic in the mix here, which is what do we do when one collection of purposes breaks down and a, and a new frame of purpose, of values, of meaning, of, of heartfelt desire has not yet emerged? Or related to that, what do you do when it's time to step off a lesser vehicle into a greater vehicle, but in between them is a big gulf? So I've definitely grappled with all three of those, uh, which to me have a very down-to-earth kind of meaning behind them. Are there things that you've done in particular that have helped you do that? Well, maybe I could talk about the middle one, which is kind of a crisis of purpose. Uh, I was in my mid-20s, and I had been a quite advantaged middle-class kid who went off to UCLA and had a lot of success there. And then I started a company teaching personal growth seminars when I think I was 23 or 24. I was such a kid. And it was very successful. And then for good reasons and bad, I ended it, kind of thrashed around a bit and then got caught up in this organization, another personal growth organization that landed me in Germany for a year where I worked living in Munich. And there, everything fell apart. I, I think of Pema Chodron's beautiful book and the title of it, When Things Fall Apart. Things had just completely fallen apart for me. I had no more standing. I had no friends. I had no status. I felt very alienated from what I was doing. I didn't see the point. I was miserable, uh, very unhappy. And I went through several days, I recall well, of really wondering, wow, why live? Why keep living? If I could experience this kind of depression and pointlessness and despair at any time in the future, which is a kind of psychological frailty, if I could experience that in the future and given that that's what I was feeling now, what's the point? So I started really asking myself, what's the point? Why keep on going? And it was in the middle of uh, a fairly comfortable day-to-day -day situation. Nobody was shooting at me. I wasn't running from my life. I wasn't a political prisoner in some dungeon somewhere. And still, what's the point? And I remember vividly walking back in Munich from um, a, a, lot, a cleaners where I was like the servant of someone that I worked for, bringing his clothes back. And I sat down on a concrete bench, kind of stared into space. And a lot of stuff crystallized for me. And I realized that in some fundamental way, I had not yet chosen to be here. I had not yet chosen this, call it incarnation. I was half in and half out. And I'm, I'm not going to make any claims about the ontological status of the experience I had here, throwing in a little philosophy, you know, the statement about the actual ultimate reality of or not of something. But I had the feeling of having been a kind of spirit coming into a body from realms of beautiful light and space and simplicity and love dropped into a human body with all the crud that went along with it, flailing a little bit like, what, wait, what? And in all that was an ambivalence about being here. Why be here? What's... And so I had one leg out all the time. My commitments were provisional. They were tentative. They were partial. I was never fully in. And my life kind of swept before my eyes. And I could feel that lack of being fully in was part of what was surfacing this question, why be here, which was half of my ambivalence. And sitting there on that concrete bench, I fundamentally chose to be here. I made an existential choice with my freedom and my responsibility. I actually chose to be here and I felt it like, okay, I'm all in. And I had this feeling of, I want to play it out in this life. I want to play out the game board. 
Um, I reserve the right if I'm stuck in some hell hole or terminal pain and illness to check out. That's my right ultimately. Uh, I reserve that right. But meanwhile, I'm in. I am in. I am fully in. I'm closing the escape hatch. I'm here to do it. And that changed everything for me. It was a corner I turned. Then afterward, I had to kind of flesh out what are my purposes. And I came to realize that people have basically three types of reasons for not jumping off a bridge, three types of reasons for continuing to be here. And I I found those three types for myself, identified them for myself, and I fleshed them out. And I can talk about that in a minute. But that was for me a really meaningful thing. And and it was real. I was I was toying with suicide in the yeah. run up to that breakthrough. Yeah. And I, as as I said toward the beginning, I don't think that I'm actually that much more philosophically inclined than you are for a lot of different reasons. But I think that one could make the argument that you had an existential crisis. Yeah. And that this existential crisis then became a catapult into a good and meaningful life. 100%. And that what actually entered you into the good and meaningful life was the existential crisis and your effective confrontation of it. Yeah. Um, uh, including the yeah, Entirely. so and and that I think is kind of the point, right? Which is that we have this confrontation, or many people have this confrontation at some point in their lives, and then it's about what you do with it. How do you face the existential crisis? And um, again, my inclination is to say, regardless of whether or not you want to frame it as like the existential dread motivated you, or whether it was your good purposes that motivated you, or whatever else, we kind of got to the same place at the end of the day, and. I hear different things in what you just said. One thing that I hear in what you said is this idea of kind of the clock is ticking, making the most of it. What can I do with this life? Hey, I'm here anyways. Let's see how great we can make it. I'm in the game. I'm I'm on the the field. Might as well play. Yeah, you're no longer spectating. Yeah, and then and you're doing something. Okay, great. So I hear that in that. Another thing that I kind of hear in it is a real um, underlying valuing of the incarnation, if you want to kind of hear it that way. Just some of the things you've said so far about, hey, being born is uncommon. Yeah. If you think about the infinite events, the infinite things that came together to create the version of you that exists in this moment, that's an uncommon thing. And uncommon things are inherently beautiful and valuable. Uh, and when you value that. something, you tend to treat it a lot better, right? Yeah. Um, Would you rather have the consciousness of a human or a flea? And and it allows you to really see not just the precious nature of your consciousness, but the precious nature of this moment of consciousness, even if this moment is occurring in circumstances that are otherwise rather unpleasant. Mm-hmm. Well, that's very beautifully said, Forrest. And, yeah, thank you. Um, I would say just for whatever it's worth is for people listening to really honor these existential crises, as it were, the deep questions. And to ask yourself, what is it about the deep questions that really engage you? Now, I have known some people who become morbidly preoccupied. That's a term from psychology, morbid preoccupation, self-preoccupied with these questions. And I want to flag first the preoccupation, which can take on a life of its own and in a funny kind of way be used to avoid actually engaging the immediacy of the people around you and the opportunities around you, et cetera. And and second, there's a lot of selfing in this preoccupation because it's all about me. What am I going to, what am I going to do with my life? right? So be careful about that. In other words, I think sometimes people can spin into a self-generated, existential, dread-saturated, nauseous kind of crisis that's not actually given in human existence altogether. It's generated. Okay, part one. Part two, I find that there are three major whys. One why I would categorize as quality of life purposes and values ranging from just the pleasures of a glazed donut, which I'll sneak when your mom's not looking, all the way out to very beautiful, sublime pleasures of listening to a wonderful symphony or subtleties of lovingness with other people. All all those things, both hedonia and eudaimonia in terms of their personal impact, quality of life purposes. 
why are you here? Why bother? What's your why? Well, I'm here to improve my quality of life broadly, which many people realize requires uh, a fair amount of eudaimonic, eudaimonia, not just hedonia. Okay, good. Second, no matter what it feels like for you, you could be here in part out of service. You want to contribute. You're, you have a purpose in contributing, utterly independent of what your personal experience of that is in terms of quality of life, hedonia or eudaimonia. You just want to help because helping is valuable. Making things better, constructing, serving, reducing suffering, promoting fulfillment and joy. Service. You're here to serve. You're here to help. That's why I'm here. Third major purpose is for me meaningfully distinct from the first two. It may seem a little subtler. It's a it's a learning purpose. You're, there's a joy of discovery, a wanting to know, a curiosity about reality, and an interest in growing, and just growing for its own sake, growing as a value in and of its own right, including aspects of growing that for some people do draw them into ultimate matters, which start verging into spirituality and religion. Independent of whether it feels good or bad, independent of whether it helps anybody else or not, learning itself, becoming more knowledgeable, becoming more awakened is a value in and of its own right. So people might think about those three categories and um, where they're at with each one of them. Mm. I think that's a great framework. Um, and it really connects to some of the frameworks that we offered a little bit earlier in the episode, this idea of, okay, how do you find the thing that removes you from the existential dread one way or the other? And a lot of it are these various considerations of meaning and purpose. To kind of loop back a little bit to something that we were talking about at the very, very beginning, often what triggers that feeling of frailty and existential crisis, whatever it might be, are considerations of uh, mortality. Essentially, life's going to end at some point. How do we feel about that one way or another? Um, and one of the great framings that I've run into is, is present in one of my favorite books by Frank Kostaseski. It's The Five Invitations, which is basically like what can death teach us about living a good life. I uh, would strongly recommend that book. It's one of my absolute favorite in the territory. But this is something that I know that you've thought about a lot, Dad, in terms of the consideration of your own life and uh, even some of those more spiritual frameworks and your kind of association with them. Um, and I was just wondering what kind of thinking you've been doing recently about that. With regard to the fear of death and related to that, the general fear of frailty, one way to deal with it is to fundamentally accept it. And it doesn't mean that we like it. Where it actually shows up a lot, I think, for people is they can accept their own death, but it pisses them off that their kids have to die. I can relate to that. And so fundamentally, we can accept it. Now, we, have, we may have to do certain things in our minds to accept it and come to terms with it. And people like Tara Brock, who's written about radical acceptance, have things to say about it. but. So many of the great um, teachings are really about just simply coming to terms with the fact of um, inevitable mortality and the fact that we will face pain in our life, emotional and physical pain, and just to accept that. And if that is too much of a price to pay for the three major kinds of values I just went through a moment ago, okay, a person may come to that. By the way, if you're thinking of suicide while you listen to this, don't do it. Really, don't do it. I mean, I respect the right of people toward, you know, in certain conditions to exercise the right for euthanasia, but otherwise, don't do it. It's a pathology. It's an illness inside you that's leading you to suicidality. Call someone, tell someone, tell a friend, um, go see a therapist, call a hotline that's confidential, don't do it. So I want to make that incredibly crystal clear. And I hope in the show notes for us, you can put some resources there. This is a really important point. A lot of people commit suicide. And um, I think in men past a certain age, it's the number one leading cause of death. So it's something really important to take care of. So my point is, basically, if you say to yourself, you know, 
a certain amount of pain is the price I pay. It's the tab for all this pleasure, broadly defined pleasure. The joys of seeing a sunrise, of getting things done, the little satisfactions of everyday life, uh, the three values, quality of life, service, and learning. Uh, if, if that may well, for you, be very, 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 very much worth the cost, the pain, the charge you're going to, you have paid and will in, in eventually pay. So that for me is, is not glib, it's very real. And it's part of making that existential choice to be here. Are you committed to being here? Are you all in? A lot of people are not. They're waiting for the final battle. They're holding back their life force, their attention, their heart. They're not coming into it with a whole heart. And partly, and I think because they are afraid to somehow, they're afraid to become fully committed in this life. And that's a great opportunity for us all to really come in and be here in our relationships, in our jobs, in our politics. Yeah, what this really moves me into is a consideration of what we can get out of this. What I mean by that is like what we can get out of the the contemplation of death, what we can get out of the existential crisis. And for me, one of the big things is it really allows me to connect with my values um, on an individual level. The idea uh, that, you know, has been shared many, many times, we have to work, but no one hits their deathbed wishing they'd spend more hours in the office or very, very few people uh, have that consideration at the end of things. And the ways in which there can be this kind of beautiful dichotomy where we find value and purpose and meaning even in the midst of being frank with ourselves about the reality of atoms smashing into atoms and this great cascade of events starting with the Big Bang. And yeah, sure, maybe it doesn't mean anything, but hey, it can still mean something to you. And I think that that is a sort of beautiful dichotomy. It's like a, 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 a contrast that is itself kind of engaging and interesting and draws me more into a uh, closeness and appreciation for life. Another thing for me is this, that it's an, it's an immediate pathway into feelings of equality. Um, we all enter, we all leave, we all feel these pains, we all go through these considerations, or at least most people do. Um, those are some things that I think that we can get out of this in a positive way. There's this metaphor that people may know, and it really has spoken to me in, in deepening and deepening ways. And it's the metaphor of the wave in the water. And uh, you're a wave, I'm a wave. I elaborated this metaphor in my book, Neurodharma, in terms of eddies. Everything is an eddy in the streaming, the unfolding streaming of reality whether it's a galaxy or a thought, a thundercloud or a bumblebee. Everything is eddies in the stream. It's one stream and all eddies disperse eventually, but the streaming endures. So in that sense, with regard to a life, uh, it is possible to hold two things side by side. On the one hand, to look at your hand, or your body, and to just appreciate the extraordinary gift of your hand, shaped by three and a half billion years of evolution. All kinds of creatures died so that tiny incremental improvements based on mutations in our genetics were had selective advantage and were then passed along to develop our own particular capabilities here. And then we have the extraordinary gift of the universe and um, coming together and then stars occurring, which then inside their fern interior furnaces at their core, we're building heavy atoms like carbon and calcium and iron, thus forming our hands, oxygen, so we could breathe. All of that inside of stars. So all that's happened here. So on the one hand, you can feel the, the preciousness of your hands and their vulnerability, the frailty and the fact that we're given if we're fortunate 80 years, maybe 100, really, that's about it to enjoy it. So on the one hand, we really can rest in this extraordinary sense of gratitude for what we've been given, alongside this very tender 
intimate feeling of the inevitable endingness of everything. Like I can look at my hands in the 69-year-old body and see the marks of aging. And I can imagine my father's hands, 35 years older than me, uh, who died just short of 97, and really see the marks of aging there. And I know you, Forrest, are 70 years behind my own dad, and you're moving in that direction. So we can hold those two together. That's, that's really precious. We can hold that together. While at the same time, with some deepening, felt insight, we can recognize that these hands, this body, these atoms, it's all just eddies, waves made of water in one sea, one vast ocean. And inevitably, this particular wave, these, this particular eddy, will disperse into the ocean while all along being ocean. As Jamal Yogis puts it, all our waves are water. And we can rest in the knowing of those two truths with, without being glib, without using any of the avoidance strategies that existentialist philosophers and psychologists have identified, fully honoring and recognizing our frailty and all that with gratitude and also with wisdom into our fundamental nature as water. It's a beautiful, uh, I almost want to say parable, because it has a sort of parable-like quality to it, a beautiful metaphor, however you want to kind of say it. And I also think that it moves us very quickly into some of the Buddhist topics that we've explored on the podcast in the past. Because again, there's this duality, right? Where you could say that people who go in a very nihilistic or the full-on existential crisis experience is about a sort of profound, uh, negatively valenced non-attachment, where they're just so, it's all purposeless and meaningless, so who cares anyways? Um, and the trick, of course, is in seeing both like the precious and beautiful nature of the moment while also not becoming excessively attached to or caught up in it and all of the problems that arise from that, that you know, Buddhism has effectively identified over several thousand years. Um, and for me, one of the ways into that, that much as, as the, you're kind of like all, all our waves are water, you know, way in, all, we're all eddies in one shared ocean way in. And this is probably going to be apparent to people who are very practiced, who are listening right now. But I've been really kind of practicing with this idea of like the space between things. You know, the space between me and another person, the space between uh, Earth and another planet, the space between this moment and another moment, whatever it might be. Um, because Can I put the hat to you for well, us. Thanks. Where in the world did you get that one? <laughs> hey, uh, I mean, a lot of things that I'm not sure if I'm comfortable talking about on the podcast just yet, for starters. <laughs> okay, but, good. you know, maybe the that's for stuff. another day. <laughs> classic, classic, wonderful. Yeah, so okay, very, good. very classic. Um, again, this is something that is present in a lot of Buddhist traditions and is present in a lot of other um, philosophical traditions as well. But basically the idea that you can become increasingly aware of the space that exists between different things, all the way down to the sense of the space inside of an atom and how most of an atom is empty space, kind of depending on how you want to define that. Um, and connected to that, the, the space between a breath, the space between a moment, whatever it is. And you could kind of push that out uh, to this really broad consideration of what's in that space. And the truth is that nothing's in that space. In that space is nothing. It's already here right now. You're with it in this moment. And I had this thing that I said to you a long time ago. Um, I think that this was like 10 years ago or something, where you asked me at the dinner table something along the lines of like, well, Forrest, are, are you afraid of death? And I really thought about it. And I went like, well, I don't think I'm afraid of death, but I have some fears about not living. And that's an interesting distinction, right? And you said something along the lines after that of like, well, why aren't you afraid of death? And I responded kind of glibly in the moment, well, I was dead for billions of years and I didn't feel a thing. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a little tongue in cheek, you know, um, but it's kind of true. Very it's on like, grand for you at the yeah, time. Yeah, right? <laughs> so th <laughs> I'm like a wise ass 24 year old. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a certain kind of like, you can have a kind of grim humor about it, 
that we've talked about previously on the podcast that can really lighten this whole consideration. Because the truth is that we all were dead for billions of years. And as far as we're aware in this moment, we didn't feel a darn thing. So where are you going with this? So we have this space. Oh, for me, that just moves me into a consideration of, of what do I have to fear if it's already here? Um, you know, what do I have to fear if it's something that on some level I've already experienced? Yeah. What do I have to be worried about if it's present with me right now already and I'm okay? Right. And I think that that for me is extremely useful and is a real antidote to a lot of those moments where I can enter into a more glum contemplation of, uh, am I really getting what I want out of this? Is my life all it's meant to be and all of that good stuff? And I, I find those practices personally useful. That's great. So two things. First, um, it's really natural for the body to, to want to stay alive. The body wants to live, typically. And it's really natural for there to be um, fear. Uh, I, I go in and I have my skin checked three, four times a year because I've had two uh, melanomas taken out of my skin that, thank goodness, were caught early and were taken out entirely, and I'm okay. But I go in, and I'm there's, my belly always does a little flip-flop before I have the dermatologist check me out because I just don't know. Um, it's natural to have that kind of soft animal of the belly. So, you know, that's another Mary Oliver line, the soft animal of the body. I think, uh, to be scared, no problem. That's, we'll call it that as a first start kind of experience. Just natural, unpleasant, fear, the willies, uneasy, fine. We're not speaking against that. There's nothing abnormal. There's nothing wrong about that kind of experience. I think where a lot of suffering comes in is when people react to that initial, natural, inherent animal uneasiness and fear and build out all kinds of emotional reactions to it that are over over the top, unnecessary, and add to a lot of suffering. That's where the second darts start throwing. So the first thing I want to do is just totally normalize, uh, you know, natural fear of dying, pain, loss of functioning, disability, uh, grieving, the loss of others. Uh, as sometimes people say, it's true for me too, uh, I want to see how it turns out. I want to say your grandkids, grandkids. I'm not going to get to do that. I'm really interested in the unfolding societal evolution of humanity, the next 10,000 years. What's going on? How about 100,000 years? Uh, there were people walking through my backyard 10,000 years ago. I think 10,000 years from now, humans will be walking around in my backyard. They might be genetically engineered, vastly augmented, <laughs> and living in a hotter world. <laughs> but they're going to be here. I'm, I'm really interested in all that. In 10,000 years, it's a nothing in the life of the universe. That bugs me. I want to see that. Okay, that's all first start stuff, but we don't need to go overboard about it. That's point one. Point two, to your, to your point, so much of our second darts are anticipatory dread. They're about the future. And there's this anecdote, true story, about a monk in Southeast Asia that kind of illustrates this point. So, this monk lived in poverty in the forest in Thailand or Burma, and he had a terrible toothache and he needed to remove a tooth, but he did not have access to dental care. And he knew that in the tool shed were pliers and he could remove his tooth himself, which he did. And people were stunned by this and they asked him, how did you handle it? It would like, oh my gosh, <laughs> right? <laughs> and he said, well, not really. So there I was in the you know, dining hall and finishing my tea and there was no pain. And then there I was taking the first step toward the tool shed. There was no pain. And then he just went through it. The second step, there was no pain and there was no pain. And then my hand was on the, the doorknob of the tool shed. There was no pain. And then I opened the door. There was no pain. And then I held the pliers in my hand. There was no pain. And then I put the pliers on my tooth. There was no pain. And then I squeezed and pulled and there was great pain. And then I, <laughs> I walked out of the tool shed. There was no pain, and I was fine. And hmm. he was totally in the present, to your point. And I, I try to think about that actually as a story, uh, because so many of our, so much of our misery has has not happened to us. It either didn't happen to us, 
or it hasn't yet happened to us. Yeah. No, I think that that's totally true. It is a great framing for everything we've talked about today as a whole. And I'm wondering, in addition to that, Dad, if there's anything you would just like to leave people with in terms of their consideration of these issues, because you've just done a lot of thinking about it yourself. I want to say that there are times that are very real for people where it's that third kind of issue I was talking about. I I said, well, there's frailty and you know, mortality and morbidity, the confrontation with that, we're vulnerable in those ways. And then second, there's these fundamental questions of why bother? Why be here? What's my why? And it's very important to find answers to that that are meaningful for you. And I've shared some of my own. Then there's this third type of issue where a familiar structure has fallen apart and we don't yet have replacement purposes. So maybe I'll just speak a few words about that. Um, I don't think it's accidental that existentialism as a philosophy arose with modernism toward the end of the 19th century, uh, because so much was falling apart at that time in terms of familiar structures of belief that gave people a why in terms of Christianity and religion. You know, existentialism arose out of Western philosophical traditions. And of course, there are many important Eastern uh, and undoubtedly African and and Native people, philosophical tradition. So I just kind of want to situate existentialism. In a person's individual life, they definitely can have times where their reasons for being have just fallen away. Maybe they grew up in a fundamentalist family, and then for one reason or another, they lost their faith, and they they didn't know what to replace it with. Or maybe um, they saw great natural disasters or personal tragedy, and they had a belief in a benevolent God. How do you account for that? Or maybe they've just stepped out of raising a family, which was their main purpose in life for 20 or 25 or 30 long, rich, good years. And now what? Now they don't know what to do. Or I've known people who had a an injury of some kind that totally derailed the course they were on. Now what's their purpose? And so there is also a third kind of existentialist sort of issue that's not uncommon for people. And one of the things that really helps is to accept and name the pickle you're in. You're in the middle of the chrysalis. When the caterpillar becomes a butterfly, there's this intermediate stage inside the chrysalis where things are a mess. And it's okay for them to be a mess for a while and not prematurely foreclose this messy, disorganized phase of growth by leaping into one thing or another to avoid the discomfort of being in the middle of the growth. That's a really important point, to tell the truth about it, to accept it, to be okay with it, and then to be curious about it, to embrace it even. All right, I'm a mess right now. All kinds of reasons have fallen apart for me, and I don't have any good new ones. And that's where I'm at. I'm looking for a new set of whys. One. Two, uh, look for people who are good examples for you that are a little further along than you are in your process. They too have had to face that kind of thing. Maybe they too are returning from a tour of duty uh, and they were uh, they were in the armed forces and they're no longer in the armed forces and they've lost their sense of purpose and meaning. Or maybe they're an empty nester. Or maybe they've come out of a fundamentalist religious framework and they don't know what to do. Look for people who are farther along, who've walked in your shoes in some ways. They'll have something really useful to tell you. For some people, it's their addiction that gave their life meaning and purpose, their alcoholism, their use of cocaine. And now that they're in their first three months of sobriety, they don't really know how to structure their life. What's my life about now when it's not about drinking? and being hung over and lying about it and kind of trying to get through each day to when I can make it to the bar, right? What, what do I do now? You know, talk to people who are further along. And then the last thing I would say is return to those three kinds of why. Quality of life, service, and learning. And see if you can find some meaningfulness for you, some fulfillment for you in one or more of those three reasons for living. Great. Yeah, no, I think that that's a really wonderful note to end on. We explored a lot today. And I think that often what happens with these episodes, which are 
a little bit more general. And we sometimes go into different episodes with like a very clear idea of what we're going to talk about. And then there are some episodes that we go into with less of a clear idea of what we're going to talk about, but we know that it's an interesting topic and we want to get into some stuff related to it. And this episode kind of falls into that second category, right? Where we felt like this was an interesting thing that was worth discussing. And we kind of roamed around a little bit with it. So we touched on many different things. I hope that there was something in here that you found personally useful. And today I had the great pleasure, as per the usual, of speaking with my dad about how we can deal with and confront a crisis of meeting. We began today's conversation by talking about where an existential crisis comes from. And according to Irving Yalom, who is a really fantastic thinker in this territory and a wonderful trainer of therapists, there are four basic issues of existence. The first is that death is inevitable. The second is that we have freedom. The world is not inherently structured and our behavior is not inherently controlled. Therefore, we have to give the world a structure and we have to find some kind of sense of meaning inside of it. Then third, we're isolated. No matter how close we come to another person, there's always going to be a degree of separation. Essentially, we're always alone. Finally, this can add up to a feeling of meaninglessness. If we're all gonna die, if we construct our own world, and if we're separate from others, what's the point of living? When we confront issues like these, it can trigger us into an existential crisis, a moment where we question our life's purpose or whether we should go on living at all. The proximity of death is a natural trigger for this, but so are some moments where you feel like you've left the structure of your normal life or when you feel very isolated from other people. People deal with an existential crisis in a variety of ways, and Rick and I explored a bunch of different methods that you can use to deal with an existential crisis if you happen to face one. These different ways fall into a couple of different categories. Some people just don't think about it. They push it out of their mind, they push it down, they repress it, they do whatever they gotta do, they do not confront the issue. Some people find sets of core beliefs, ideas, values that they feel give their life purpose and meaning. A lot of religious beliefs fall into this category, as do some personal moral frameworks. Then people might distract themselves. They might really enjoy life in a variety of different ways. This tends to be a little bit more hedonic, but I would imagine you could probably distract yourself eudaimonically as well. And then finally, they might refocus the energy from the existential crisis into creating things of purpose, value, and meaning. This is often referred to as sublimation, and it's more or less what Rick was describing when he talked about the own existential crisis that he faced when he was in his early 20s living in Germany. And what he described was this feeling of listlessness, worthlessness, meaninglessness, and really just seeing his profound separation from other things, from other people. He had had a meaningful endeavor that fell by the wayside, he was doing work he didn't care about. He felt like his life wasn't going anywhere. Ugh, now what? Why go on? And he emphasized these different dimensions that people might find in their own life that could give them a sense of meaning and purpose. He talked about just enjoying life, appreciating the wild and beautiful nature of your one precious life, appreciating how lives are rare and uncommon, uh, thinking about all of the different circumstances, the different causes and conditions that had to come together to culminate in your life right now. Wow, that's amazing. That can move us into a profound sense of appreciation. Then he talked about a kind of moral dimension. Well, maybe things are tough for me, but I'm gonna do my best to make them better for other people. What can I do to contribute so that I've left something behind that will maybe even outlast me? And then third, he talked about a broad value of learning, discovery, attaching to things outside of the self, seeing if you can figure out more of what's going on in this very, very strange world we're all living in. And to him, that's where the more spiritual dimension emerges, connecting with something that maybe he feels like is a little bit beyond the self. We talked for a while about how existential dread or existential fear can actually be a positive motivator toward good ends. Uh, we often talk on the podcast about this idea of the view from the porch. When you're sitting on the porch, you're an older person, you're looking back over your life. What will you wish you had done? 
And if you want to, you can engage this as almost a meditative practice. You can close your eyes if you're uh, not operating heavy machinery or driving on the road as you listen to this, and think to yourself, what would it be like to be that older version of myself? What would it be like to look back over the course of my life? What would I be more grateful for? And what would I wish that I had maybe done differently? And you can really contemplate that. You can feel that emerge inside of yourself very naturally. And then you can open your eyes, look around, and go, wow, I'm back in this different body again. I'm back in this younger body again. And I have time now that I didn't have when I was sitting on the porch as that older version of myself. And what do I want to do with that time? And that can be a really beautiful contemplation for a person. It can be a very natural way to drop into that sense of opportunity that we often lose when we're entering into the fullness of that existential crisis. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the podcast. It was a little bit more philosophical than our typical content. So I'm kind of curious to see how this episode does and to see whether or not people are interested in these kinds of topics. If you were interested, please feel free to let us know about it. You can reach us at contact at beingwellpodcast.com. You can always reach out to us through social media as well. I've included the links to our various social profiles in the description of today's episode. If you've been enjoying the podcast, please remember to subscribe to it through the platform of your choice and maybe even tell a friend about it. It's one of the best ways we have to reach new people. If you want to support the podcast in other ways, you can also leave a rating and a positive review. That really helps us out. Or you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. Thanks again for listening. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you again soon.